Welcome. Thank you for attending How Functional Labs Can Improve Lyme Disease Patient Outcomes. I am Dr. Lily Liu Wing, and I will act as your moderator. All attendees are in listening mode, so please submit your questions in the virtual Q&A or chat application. The content of this webinar is for educational and informational purposes only. The information is not to be interpreted or mistaken for clinical advice. Please consult a medical professional or healthcare provider for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And let me uh, present to you today, Dr. Chris Turnpaul from Turnpaul Health and Wellness Center and Dr. Kim Bruno, who is a clinical lab educator here at Vibrant America. Dr. Chris Turnpaul is a practitioner and CEO at Turnpaul Health, a functional, functional medicine wellness center, uh, at a functional medicine wellness center, which he founded in 1999. The center, one of the largest in the country, has grown to over 20 healthcare providers and a team of more than 60 in five locations. Turnpaw Health provides in-depth holistic care, focusing on functional medicine, investigating the mechanism of dysfunction in patients. The clinic also, sorry, the clinic also provides integrative family medicine, lifestyle medicine, and many complementary wellness services. Over his 20 years in practice, Dr. Turnpaw has joined ILADS and is known as a thought leader in Lyme disease and associated co-infections. He also traveled to Lake Como to participate on the PANDAS International Board. He has a deep interest and extensive knowledge in pediatric neurological disorders and methods of supporting these children holistically. Dr. Turnpaw has lectured on a broad variety of health topics, both nationally and internationally. His application of functional medicine as it relates to the neuroendocrine immune systems is a unique clinical approach to non-pharmacological treatments. He is well-respected among his peers and patients as a provider and functional medicine instructor. He has treated thousands of patients in his practice and mentored hundreds of practitioners. His true passion is teaching functional medicine to other practitioners and helping patients optimize their health. Dr. Bruno received her doctor in chiropractic medicine from National University of Health Sciences in Chicago and successfully completed the Certified Clinical Nutritionist Board Examination. Prior to coming to Vibrant America, she owned a private practice for 15 years and worked hand in hand with a variety of integrative healthcare practitioners in multi multidisciplinary practices. Dr. Bruno is a Colorado native who enjoys hiking and paddleboarding. She finds most joy in spending time outside in nature with her husband and two daughters. So I'll turn it over to you guys now. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, as the title says, we're gonna be talking about uh, utilizing functional labs, labs to improve your um, Lyme disease patient outcomes. And so that means really going beyond the just straightforward positive and negative. Um, so I'm gonna let Dr. Turnpaw take it away. Um, and then we will do, we're just going to have kind of a nice conversation, go through various different situations. Um, like Dr. Lilly said, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. <clears throat> and we're going to be able to just really show some uh, showcase really how we can utilize this testing. Thank you. So uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, I think this presentation is limited to an hour. And as many of you are aware, Lyme disease is a lifetime of study. So uh, just a few points in the beginning. When we when we go through the presentation, just to point out, I'm sure many of you have heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect. Uh, when I first graduated, I quickly went to the peak of Mount Stupid, thought I knew everything the first year I was in practice, quickly went to the Valley of Despair, and I'm probably somewhere on the slope of enlightenment now after 25, 26 years of doing this. So this presentation is to kind of give you uh, the backbone or the starting point, but uh, just encourage everybody, including myself, that this is an ongoing journey that is never fully vetted or figured out. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Also to put in here Bloom's taxonomy, uh, if you're familiar with this, the first step at the bottom is just kind of learning the information and then understanding the information, trying to apply it. The goal is really to get up to critically analyze and evaluate this and then create a treatment plan for your patients. So in this presentation, we're not going to get up to the top three levels. We're just trying to present information and give you some latitude to fully understand um, some of the nuances of Lyme disease as it is one of the most complicated and difficult. And when, when I say Lyme disease, 
it really means tick-borne illness. So we'll talk about Lyme disease quite a bit, but tick-borne illness, and uh, and we'll dive a little bit into the chronicity of how that that manifests. So goals of the the webinar are really to understand Vibrant's tick-borne testing advantages, understanding who might benefit from a test, a pre-work pre-test workup seeing the differences and the nuances between an acute Lyme presentation, maybe understanding some of the patterns and the considerations for um, Lyme disease, and then looking at more in-depth holistic approaches such as an immune shift or mitochondrial, mitochondrial dysfunction, oxidative stress. And last, but also first, is understanding the basic foundation of physiology so that we say often, it's not just the, the burden of the, the, the disease or the burden of pathology, but it's also the health of the host. And the health of the host matters. We actually say the health of the host matters most. So uh, how healthy you are when you, when you get bit by a tick matters. We say genes matter. There's a lot of rabbit holes you can go down, but it's not just a, a pathogenic or a vector-borne disease. It's a vector-borne disease manifested over a series of genes and the health of the host when you're bit. So that's important to us. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Bruno for, for a little bit of this. Only thing I'll preface this is many of us in the Lyme world, and I've been in ILAD since 1999. So um, there's a lot of bias of what test is best, what test to use. And I can say very comfortably, I'm not married to any lab. Uh, I do what's best for the patient. And I feel that the the vibrant testing is the best, if not one of the best out there uh, for a broad number of reasons. For me, I get a lot of information for uh, for a broad number of tick-borne or vector-borne diseases on a single panel at what I consider a reasonable cost. Um, so you'll hear a lot of things out there. A lot of them are either um, they're financially motivated or they're they have they've been married to a lab for a long period of time. I'm here to tell you as an independent non-employee of vibrant that uh, I'll choose what's best for the patient and I choose vibrant labs. Thank you. Yeah, and if anybody has any questions about any of the bullet points here, please reference back to the webinar that I did at the beginning of May, where we really dove deep into the third-party uh, validation or the third-party publication, our CAP accreditation, about what was on each individual panel. But we just wanted to recap here um, You know why so many providers choose Vibrant is because we do bring this level of a comprehensive panel with highest levels of validations, publications, mm -hmm. and accreditations all into a very um, competitive and reasonable price for our patients. So this is just a recap. Like I said, if you wanted to dive deeper into that, please reference the other webinar. Um, but this is really why we are choosing to um, present this topic utilizing the Vibrant testing. So if we go into a little bit of, of who should be tested and how to be tested uh, um, or who should be tested, the first point is a detail-driven complex history. That's the key. I'm in central Pennsylvania, so we're kind of, no pun intended, we're the bullseye for Lyme disease. Uh, so we actually have every patient fill out the, M the Horowitz questionnaire, uh, the MSIDS questionnaire. I'll reference Dr. Horowitz if you're not familiar with him. He's one of the thought leaders in Lyme disease. He's written several books. He's testified in front of Congress. Uh, he's done a lot of homework and a lot of publications for Lyme disease. So there's a questionnaire that Vibrant has made available to everybody, um, and they can fill out the questionnaire. It has, it's been validated. So that is a valid way of, of uh, assessing and addressing whether the patient has tick-borne illness or Lyme disease. Also, I put in here that according to Dr. Horowitz, 72% of the time where he finds Lyme disease, he also finds immune dysregulation. So it is more than just a pathogenic burden. A couple points. If you have an Enum rash, it's, a, it's definitive of Lyme disease without testing. Now you, So if they have a rash, you know they have Lyme disease regardless of what others might say. In addition to that, though, most of the patients will come in and they don't remember having a rash. The importance of this is even if they have Lyme disease and you know they have Lyme disease from the rash or the bullseye rash, they still need to be completely tested for co-infections. So um, 
The rash only shows up in 50% of positive cases. So I said most of the patients don't remember being bit by a tick. And in our office, less than 50% actually remember seeing a bullseye rash. If you test too early, you won't see the, um, or if they've had antibiotics use, use early, you won't see them seroconvert into the immunoglobulins. They haven't had a chance to develop their immunoglobulins yet. So you have to wait a period of time for that, those immunoglobulins or those antibodies to uh, produce and show positive. And the testing will help to confirm your diagnosis and it's very important to include all of your co-infections and have a comprehensive test. So many, especially the two major boards that kind of govern this is IDSA, Infectious Disease Society of America, and the ILADS. And they differ greatly. You'll see a lot of um, diminishment in the, the Infectious Disease Society. They say it's an acute infection treated with a short course of antibiotics and the rest of it doesn't exist. This has pretty much been proven false. Uh, major university uh, hospitals, such as that small one you may have heard of, Johns Hopkins. So they actually say that there is such thing as, as a chronic infection or chronic Lyme. So this is the tool that will be available through, through uh, Vibrant America as well. And this is the Horowitz questionnaire. And you'll see a lot of uh, different questions that they can, they can answer. Um, and through this, you can pre-screen your patients to see who might be uh, requiring further testing or if the, the symptoms kind of match. You can do this through an interview as well. This, object, this objectively tells the patient uh, what's going on based on a score. So you get like a number and a data point to, to base it on. You can also use these going forward to see if the patient's symptoms have improved and how they're doing. On the testing, you'll see the next, this next slide here, you'll get kind of a, if it's the days matter when you test for, for what points there. But if you look at the bottom of this, if you get a, a number equal to or greater than 63, there's a high probability that they have a tick-borne illness. And that alone will, will cue you in or clue you in that there's very likely Lyme disease there or a tick-borne illness. And then if you're not sure which one, you certainly want to test. And even if they are positive for Lyme, there's confounders of the, the co-infections, which are very important to look for. I took this directly from Dr. Horowitz, and it's very telling. There's only seven reasons that somebody can have. There's only seven documented diagnoses for migratory joint pain. And if you look on here, they're pretty easy to rule out six of them, right? So if somebody has Crohn's or inflammatory bowel disease, that's easy to figure out. If they have acute rheumatic fever, again, we can check for that. If they have Reuters syndrome or systemic lupus, uh, if they have hepatitis or gonococcal arthritis, th these are ones that can cause migratory joint pain. That's kind of your number one question. If, if they have pain in a joint, then it starts to move around. My knee was killing me for a couple of days and then it went away and my ankle started hurting or my shoulder started hurting. Interesting though, that the only disease that has migratory nerve pain documented is Lyme disease. So if they have migratory nerve pain, it's kind of a, a, a bingo, you know that that's gonna be there. So some of the clinical presentations which you'll find are here. It's not just a joint pain. So you'll see the top fatigue and joint pain are, are at the top, but we'll find you'll find as you start to see more and more Lyme patients or start to un uncover more of the tick-borne diseases, you'll see all kinds of a host of symptoms or what I diagnosed as I don't feel gooditis. So if they have I don't feel gooditis, you probably have to use in your diff dye uh, tick-borne illness. And many times it goes just to neuro Lyme. Uh, my wife had Lyme disease in 2003 and she had no joint pain whatsoever. She had severe neurologic pain. We had to work her up for uh, MS. Um, so it, it, it affected just her nervous system. And we see a large, again, we're in central Pennsylvania and we're kind of known as Lyme literate doctors in the area too. So we see a lot of Lyme disease and tick-borne illnesses that have don't have joint pain. So don't just think it's joint pain. Uh, your elbow swelled up after you were bit by a tick. It, it's much more than that. So this is uh, a pretty obvious acute positive Lyme. 
um, and I'll digress. Most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with this, but the IgM is the first one to show up, and the IgG is a little bit later. It's called seroconversion when they go from M to G. Uh, so this is somebody who's had an acute Lyme. The criteria are different for the CDC. The CDC criteria were set up for basically arthritic Lyme, and it doesn't even encompass things like neuro Lyme or, or anything that doesn't have the joint pain involvement. Now, this panel has more on it than some of the other testing you'll do. You see bands 31 and 34 on here. These were removed when they came out with the Limerix vaccine because the vaccine actually used um, the uh, outer shell protein, uh, OSBA and OSB, um, for the, the Lyme vaccine. The Lyme vaccine was pulled from the market, and so they really should be put back in. They're highly specific for Lyme disease. So 31 and 34 aren't on your common um, everyday, you know, LabCorp and Quest tests. Some other ones that are on here that aren't on all of the other ones are the VLSC1 and the C6 peptide. So there is additional information on here. So you'll see at the bottom, there's the CDC or Infectious Disease Society of America criteria. And then there's an alternative positive, which Vibrant uh, has deemed is also a positive test. Yeah. I'll just add that in consulting with providers and also with, when we talk to patients, very often when we test for Lyme, this is what they expect to see. But what I want to urge you as a provider who's going to be treating patients, most of them who are going to be chronic, um, unless you are in an area where you are treating an acute situation, is that this, is the this type of lab presentation is not going to be the most common that you will see. So we wanted to put it here to really compare and contrast to the next slide, which is a much more common presentation, which is a little less, um, you know, all lit up where this is where we get a lot of questions. So, um, you know, the other one was acute. Obviously, that's a don't miss that one. That's everybody's going to understand this. But look at this test, how now we're seeing, you know, based on these criteria, we see three negatives and one positive, and we see, you know, some yellows and some reds. And this is where the art of the interpretation comes in rather than just the science of just looking for the positive. So this is going to be a much more common presentation of what you might see in a chronic patient. Agree totally. And, and everybody agrees on the first one, like Dr. Bruno said, you're going to, everybody, even infectious disease, the most conservative is going to agree with that. When you're not going to see that very often, you're not going to see that very often. And where you're going to get into the hierarchy of uh, addressing, assessing, and treating Lyme disease is you're going to see a lot of this. And if you're going to serve Lyme disease patients, it takes a little bit of thick skin because you're going to have uh, your, your professionals, your coworkers, your um, colleagues that are going to say, this isn't Lyme disease. And they're looking at it for the CDC criteria, which again was developed just for arthritic Lyme. So it negates all the other types of Lyme. So if you have neuro Lyme, which is very well, um, or you can have Lyme that affects the heart, uh, it's the CDC criteria wasn't even set up for that. So very important to know that this is more likely what you're going to see. Um, and this hits the alternative Lyme criteria. And there are those in the Lyme world, including Dr. Horowitz, who has even more narrow um, positives. So he can see positives in a different way. For me, if I see the VLSE1 or the C6 peptide, those are positive to me. They're so specific to Lyme, they're positive to me. And then you have to go into the matrix of what makes a uh, alternative positive versus a uh, CDC positive. You have the criteria here um, for for what makes a positive um, for alternative criteria as well as the CDC criteria, whether it's IgM or IgG. I find it kind of ironic that they leave off quite a few of the IgM bands for positive. I, that doesn't make any sense to me. How can you have an IgG band that didn't get IgM positive first? So um, it, it's just a, a weird, narrow uh, view of how to address this. So uh, Dr. Bruno, do you have anything else to say on this slide? 
Um, I would say we dive pretty deep into this criteria in the previous mm -hmm. webinar, but understanding that when you see those four blocks of like the three negatives and the one positive, that lower left-hand box is the most important when you're trying to determine that chronic patient, because that's your IgG column and then your alternative line criteria. And that really hones in on your chronic patient and more likely what they're going to present with. Um, and so you can see the flow charts here, but by utilizing that alternative criteria, you're increasing your sensitivity from a 72%, which is the CDC criteria, alternative Lyme criteria is 100% um, sensitive. You do that with a clinical correlation or utilizing the test as a confirmatory tool. Now, all of a sudden you have your diagnosis by looking at that one box, even though Vibrant offers you all of the information that's available in the marketplace, we want to make sure that that's the most important box you're looking at. So then uh, I also took from Dr. Horowitz, it's pretty famous now, it's called Lyme Bingo. Now this is according to Dr. Horowitz, uh, if you have any of these bands, you have Lyme disease. So anything in the 30s, 31, 34, 39, 23, and the 83, 93 band. Uh, it's important to note that 41 is any flagella. So the joke is if you've ever sneezed, you might have a positive 41. So don't think 41 is one of those specific bands. The 23, 31, 34, 39, 83, 93. If you have any one of these, he would say you have Lyme disease. I would also include in his bingo C6 peptide and VLSE1. They're so specific to me that I think that they're very suspicious for Lyme disease. Yeah. And we'll show you some demonstrating some labs. So in this particular band or this particular presentation, the criteria is met. Um, and that is great. We can go off of that. But then what is also very significant for this particular patient is that the IgM, the high IgM for band 31, and then the um, IgG for the 23 to 25 band. So that just helps to give us that more that next level of evidence that yes, in addition to the positive criteria, we are also seeing these quote unquote bingo bands, which are very highly specific for Lyme. So it you know it helps us to pull that picture together when we're interpreting this test. Right. So a, a good example here is if you see the 31 band, which is greater than two standard deviations from the norm, making it red, IgM positive, plus you see a VLSE1 uh, almost at that level for an IgG band. This patient certainly uh, has had Lyme. Uh, I would say this this patient is pretty pretty certain that they have Lyme disease and it's active due to the IgM band of the 31. But they could just have the VLSE1 at the top and that tells me it, IgG, and that tells me they've had an exposure. And then you get into the questionnaire and find out what's going on. Is this active? Is it not active? If they have these type of bands, even if they're IgG and they've never been treated, that creates more suspicion that it's it's in the background is chronic. Mm -hmm. So um, Dr. Bruno put this in here for us because there was a time where C6 peptide was going to be the hallmark. The CDC abandoned it, but there was a time where they were going to use the CD, uh, the C6 peptide as a specific positive marker for that. So you have that in there for your reference. I, I find that a lot of my IDSC uh, colleagues in the area have never even heard of C6 peptide, yet it was one of those that was going to be the standard for um, Lyme disease diagnosis. Absolutely. So this is an interesting one, right? Go ahead. Oh, no, you go You go forward, because this is just a nice example. Yeah, this is a great example where you see, oh, it's negative. And if you just go to the bottom, you'll see, well, it's CDC negative and it's alternative criteria negative. But we see a band 34 that shows up. Yes, it's very low on the IgG, but that VLSE1 at such a high level, that creates a lot of suspicion for me that they have that. Then you couple that with the MSID score of 48, which creates a, a, a pretty big concern so they have negative criteria. They hit an MSID score of a higher probability. They have the C6 peptide is, um, is 18, which is one of my two bingo. The VLSE and the C6 are, are bingo bands for me. So you see both of those. This is highly suspicious, especially when you couple that with the clinical presentation in your workup with the MSID score of a 48. 
So these are things where you're wanting to look for those little nuances that, you know, you're not just looking for the positive, you got to read through it and, and understand some of those other um, details. Um, and so we added those articles in for you. And this is a great presentation because this is a patient who uh, looks negative, and I would agree they look negative, but they score a 60 on the MSIT score. And then we go and do a history, and they're on steroids for joint pain, which, again, joint pain is a high criteria for Lyme disease. But if they're on steroids, they're suppressing the immune response. So if you're on steroids, you're probably not going to see a high burden of antibodies being produced because they're on immune suppressants like steroids. And many of these patients will come in on these immune suppressants, especially steroids, because they have this chronic inflammatory condition, which um, sometimes responds well short term to steroids. So this is a great example that she put in here for understanding, again, a nuance of this test. The testing isn't everything. It starts with a, a good clinical uh, uh, presentation and history taking and an MSID score. There's more to it than just the testing. So I wouldn't rely, I wouldn't hang my hat just on the test, especially in this situation. And this is also important to look that you can um, remember that when you do a blood draw, you can order the total immunoglobulins as a free add-on. So in that past ex um, example, the patient had low total IgGs, meaning that they are not able to mount an efficient um, immune system response. And so when that happens, you can hypothesize, there's no exact conversion here, but this is where you use that clinical brain and say, okay, is this 8.9 or this 8.5 or this 9.8 at the bottom, are those more significant because they're pulling from a smaller pool of IgGs? And you couple that with knowing that they've been on steroids and their MSID score, and now you have this clinical picture more so than just looking for the quote unquote positive. And here we see some of the co-infections. So uh, I can't stress enough not to just look for Lyme disease or Borrelia burgdorferi. <laughs> there's many other strains of that, but there's also the co-infections. The most common are Bartonella and Babesia, and we'll go over a couple symptoms that they present with as well. And so if we just look at the bottom one here, the Bartonella, we would, I would say to this patient, you have seen Bartonella before. Now, does that mean you were able to overcome it because your immune system was strong enough? Have you ever been assessed and treated for Bartonella? The same with the Babesia. Um, these love to hide. They're very hard to detect uh, through other PCRs, very hard to detect these because they're not in the fluid that is drawn. So uh, these need to be assessed with every case as well, the, the co-infections. This is a great little synopsis of some of the symptoms with the co-infections. So night sweats, we, especially in females, we're gonna say, oh, you're perimenopausal, it's night sweats. Well, night sweats, if they're not perimenopausal, what are they coming from? And, and Babesia is a huge one. Air hunger is a common question. And a patient who, if you say, do you have, air hunger, not necessarily shortness of breath, they will tell you, nobody's ever asked me that before. I didn't know how to describe it before, but that's exactly what I feel. I feel air hunger. Um, <clears throat> so it's very important. And it is important to also say, to be fair, these are not always from Babesia, as we know, but these are critical questions to ask to see if they have that. You can certainly have a lot of these symptoms that aren't Lyme disease, but you want to rule it out. And the Bartonella there's a common theme they actually call Bartonella brain or Bart brain. So it really affects the central nervous system. If you see stretch marks on a patient that are, I mean, to make it super easy, if they're dark red and they're going in the wrong direction, it's Bartonella. So if you see stretch marks on a patient on their back going up and down and they're red, it's Bartonella. It just, until proven otherwise, if you see goofy stretch marks that are dark red or they're red at times and they're not red at times, so they kind of come out as red and then they don't, it's Bartonella. So super good, easy questions to ask. Many, most of the patients that ask these questions too, that when they answer yes to them, nobody's ever asked them these questions before, so. And I usually will, you know, it maybe ask a couple of the very obvious ones, things like night sweats, shortness of breath, rage, 
in that initial intake. And then once we've determined the pretest probability, it's time for them to get a test. When we get the test back with a complete list of co-infections, and we now know they have evidence of exposure, IgG serology being high of Babesia and Bartonella, then you can circle back and you can ask them some of these others, you know, do you have ringing in the ears? Do you have vivid and, vivid and violent dreams? Do you have nightmares? You know, do you have tachycardia or photophobia? Things that, again, maybe you didn't ask initially because you were just went through that initial screen, but then you can dig deeper on the review when you get the test back. And then that's exactly where, when Dr. Turnkoff said, a lot of times they're like, oh my gosh, I do have these horrible nightmares and I never knew why, or I never knew that they were associated or they could be associated with that type of presentation. So it's helpful to always circle back to these symptom profiles. And th these can be severe. I'll share, I mean, when you start to see more and more tick-borne illness, the stories are not outliers. They become the norm. We had a patient yesterday we had to get the police involved with. He turned 18 years old. So his mom got him tested when he was 17. Uh, he tested positive for Bartonella and Lyme. And uh, then he turned 18. So now he's not under his mom's authority, so to speak. He was so psychotic, he thought his mom was a demon and chopped the door down where she was hiding with an ax. We had to get the police involved to save her life. And he thought she was a demon. And that's from Bartonella. So when you say, I mean, you don't see them all that severe. That was yesterday. So this isn't that one time that happened in, you know, 2007. This was yesterday in our office. Um, and then it was followed by a pandas flare in the afternoon for a, another child who had Bartonella as well. So when you start to see these seemingly irrational behaviors in patients, um, these don't respond very well to the, 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 the medications for um, mood disorder. So they're not, if they're on these medications for mood disorder and they're unresponsive and they seem to be growing more and more irrational, uh, I think certainly I'd put in the bucket of their differential diagnosis of these tick-borne diseases. Uh, it's pretty, and it it's, compassion goes a long way because this child isn't a murderer. He's just, it's sick. He needs some help. So, so that, that's my little <laughs> yesterday uh, highlight of what, what Bartonella brain can do to you. So. So this picture is a picture we use in our office. All of our clinicians use it. I, I say it's my whole life on a piece of paper. It looks kind of cumbersome, but I'm going to explain it uh, quite hopefully understandable. The very top, you have an antigen present, presenting cell. And this can be from anything. This can be typically thought of classically as infection. So virus, uh, bacteria, spirochete, something foreign that's being presented to the immune system. Uh, it's also important to say that this can be uh, from toxins, environmental toxins, anything that that triggers the immune system to be upregulated, that gets presented or handed off to a naive T cell. Under normal situations, we'd like to see that naive T cell grow up to become a regulatory cell right in the middle. And the regulatory cell regulates the, 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 the Th1s, the Th2s, the 17s, the 9s, all of the, the different T helper cells you see there. When you get an infection, you tend to have that antigen presentation to the naive T cell and it shifts over to Th1. And you'll see over here, Th1 works directly with the natural killer cells in the innate immune system and they type, tend to fight infections. There's a little bit of a seesaw between the ones and the twos with the fulcrum being the regulatory cell. When you're under a chronic state, Th1 can get depleted and you can shift towards a Th2 dominant immune system. Th2 drives Th17, and I don't want to get bogged down in this if you've never seen this before, but Th17 drives autoimmunity. Now, this is immune activation of your uh, body to attack self. So this is a very clear, easy yellow brick road to go from infection to autoimmunity. From So you have infectious-driven autoimmune reactivity or autoimmune disease and it's important to know here that you can have Lyme disease or tick-borne illness. You can recover from it, but you have already triggered that Th2, Th17 response, driving you to autoimmunity, and that can lead to the very same symptoms. The other antigen presentation that can be done is from food peptides. So I have over here on the right, 
you have food and then you have your gut barrier. And when the food comes in or you develop sensitivity to a food, the food can present to the immune system the same way that um, uh, a vector-borne illness can present. I have a, this one is not new, it wasn't yesterday, but I have a famous story in our office. I had a patient who had a bullseye rash on her deltoid here. And she had Lyme disease, she's recovered. Whenever she eats gluten, she gets the bullseye rash back. It is the weirdest thing. I couldn't make the story up if I tried. So she eats gluten, she gets the bullseye rash. Guess what else happens when she eats gluten? She gets all of the symptoms she had when she had Lyme disease. So that's not a case where more antibiotics are going to kill gluten. It's just not going to work that way. So this is where it branches out. It becomes more convoluted as to, is this active infection? Is it immune shift? Is it health of host? What's going on here? Have we driven that immune shift over to a Th2 dominant immune um, bias, which is leading to autoimmunity and inflammatory cytokines, which they still can feel the same way they did and have the same exact symptoms they had when they had the tick-borne illness in the absence of the disease. So this is where it gets, you know, you get your clinical investigative hat on to say, is this active infection, is it reactivation, or is it the fact that the host has shifted their immune system into a way where they've become TH2 dominant? So, and this is where we start to branch out and say, what else could be going on? Do they have food reactive antibodies? Do they have, um, do they have self-reactive antibodies? And these, this is where you can get into the more nuance of testing and figure out what else might be going on. It helps to clinically uh, differentiate. I don't need to kill the bug as much as I need to support the patient. How do I help the patient heal? On my little diagram here, and I've drawn this iteration many times, if you look, you'll see not just autoimmune disease and cancer can be driven by this, but you see addiction and mood disorders, which can kind of go together, um, they can be affected by this as well. So it really opens up Pandora's box. When you get in this chronic tissue breakdown stage of chronic inflammation, that also that chronic inflammation, most of this immune system lives around your, your gut and your gut associated lymphoid tissue. So the tissue breakdown from the chronic inflammation can lead to leaky gut, which is going to then promote more uh, food reactivity. So I love this image. Yeah, right. this is great way uh, just to rip open Pandora's box and be yeah. like, okay, we saw all those lab presentations, and now we're just going to zoom out and go through everything yeah. else. I love it. So, it, and you can evaluate, you can run certain things like you can run your natural killer cells, but if, if the patient it has a lot of this autoimmune reactivity, and you can cheat a little bit, so your hollow space is like your, if you have allergies, asthma, or upper respiratory tract infections or chronic UTIs, this is classically, not always, but classically a TH2 dominant immune system. So this is an immune shift, more likely to have these type of symptoms. So I put together kind of in CRAN, which I'm kind of famous for, so a very basic block. So the first thing is, do you have tick-borne illness, right? So do you have a tick-borne illness? you have to determine what tick-borne illness it is. So how many infections you have? And I didn't put there, do you have an infection? Because many times it's how many. Do you have, uh, what type of Borrelia species do you have? Do you have, what type of Bartonella do you have? Or do you have anything else going on? Not just do you have Lyme disease, but do you have a tick-borne illness? And then when you have that, Use whatever is in your arsenal to do the appropriate kill protocol. So um, we're not here to give you the protocols, which is a four-letter word in my book anyway, but what can you do? What is in your toolbox, whether it be antibiotics or herbals or a combination of, of whatever you use to do your kill protocol? And then once you do that, we have to assess, well, whatever you did as your kill protocol very likely had a negative effect on your mitochondria. So even though it's appropriate to kill, and I'll just go very simple, scratch the surface. If you're using antibiotics, you're creating mitochondrial dysfunction. So antibiotics have a negative effect on the mitochondria. Are you addressing oxidative stress in the body, which can be Again, the health of the host, what was the condition or the burden they were under, toxic burden they were under prior to getting the illness? Do they have that Th1, Th2 immune shift? 
as a consequence of either chronic infection or chronic infection combined with other burdens they have going on. Do they have a, I'm not gonna touch too much on this because this is another rabbit hole, but you can have a chronic inflammatory response syndrome, SIRS, which is not that Th1 or Th2 shift. This is the innate immune system before it even gets to the T helper cells. Um, so that can be going on after the disease is gone. After the illness, I should say, the pathogenic burden is gone, you can still have a chronic inflammatory response syndrome in the absence of an, a, a, a pathological illness. And then what else is going on? Do you have PCBs, heavy metal, do you have plastic, water damage building, mold, other biotoxins? And let's not forget the basics, basic physiology, um, basic nutrition, and sleep patterns. So all of these are going to need to be addressed and supported. It's not just you had Lyme disease and we killed it. In rare instances, if you get a fresh case of Lyme disease and a fresh kill of Lyme disease, these will recover quite easily. Most of us are going to see the chronic patient who has I don't feel gooditis for many years, misdiagnosed, and then we see, well, we found that it was a, a, a vector-borne illness or tick-borne illness, and then they have suffered for a long period of time. So they now at this point do have a lot of these confounders uh, to the left. And then after this patient has been chronic for a while and you support all these things, a huge piece is most, if not all these patients will need some psychological support. These patients have suffered for a long period of time. Majority have been told they're crazy. Uh, majority have been tried antidepressants. There's nothing wrong with you. Your test is negative. Uh, they put them on some short courses of some things that hasn't worked. Nobody's partnered up with them, walked arm in arm with them down the street to get them healthy. Nobody has been their advocate in health. So they have suffered a significant amount of psychological damage. And this, quite honestly, um, most of these patients could benefit from some, some psychological support. Uh, in our office, actually, we have a full-time psychologist who sees all these patients. So it's it's mandatory that they see all these patients just to get through the the psychological trauma that they have. So that's, in a nutshell, that just kind of takes us through um, what all goes into, it's much more complicated than even determining if they have Lyme disease, which in and of itself is a gray area because so many people are are controversial about that. But then once you get into, oh, they do, that's just the, that's just step one of understanding how to go after these things. So we put in just a few bullet points, um, some considerations for mitochondrial dysfunction. Most of us are familiar with this, but I put it in here. Well, actually, Dr. Bruno put it in here for me. So <laughs> thank you. Um, oh. Extreme common fatigue. If it's, a, it's if they're constantly fatigued, if, if they've had chronic antibiotic use, they have mitochondrial dysfunction. I have a patient too. She came in to see me. She was on 24 years of antibiotics and her current doctor recommended another year. And my statement was very simple. If you didn't kill it in 24 years, what makes you think you're going to kill it in 25? And by the way, the amount of damage you did in 24 years of taking antibiotics, both IV and oral, was significant. So some testing you can do is not a great direct test, but you can do some micronutrient testing that checks for support for uh, mitochondria such as carnitine and CoQ10. Uh, a, a surrogate is if your HDL triglyceride ratio exceeds uh, one to three. Now, this has to be fasting, of course, because if you're not fasting, your triglycerides go up. But if you fasted for 10 to 12 hours and your triglycerides are still high, that means your mitochondria are not utilizing that fuel and they're fatiguing. And triglycerides and HDL are, are inversely proportional. So as your triglycerides go up, your HDL goes down. Um, so if you see somebody who happens to get at this lab and they're not fasting, you'll see their HDL is real low and their triglycerides are real high. It's pushed that way. Some actually, we try to push the envelope in this and we actually say one to two, but the, many people say one to three. So I cruised in at one to three because it's less controversial. If you're one of my patients, I like to see a one to two ratio. So, and it's, it's a pretty good marker. Considerations for oxidative stress. Uh, well, one of the considerations for oxidative stress is mitochondrial dysfunction. So if you have, if you have mitochondrial dysfunction and you're going through anaerobic uh, respiration, you're going to get some uh, free radicals produced. 
You can use your oxidized LDL on a test, and then you can do additional testing such as heavy metals, environmental toxins, and your PFAS test. So we can see what might be burdening the patient even prior to being infected or going through the treatment. And this is nice because uh, sometimes if the patient doesn't seem to be doing better, you want to do more kill, kill, kill. And it's not always kill, kill, kill. Sometimes it's addition by subtraction. If we take some of these things away from you, that's important. I put in here just a summary, summary slide of the oxidative stress, total tox burden of heavy metals and environmental toxins, which are ubiquitous, right? So if you look at the environmental toxins, everybody has exposure. It's a matter of how much it's affecting them. Then considerations for the immune shift. This goes back to my picture, which is, again, a, a kind of our starting point here. So do they have autoantibodies? This is a great time to think about doing the neurozoomer. So if they have had an exposure and it's been chronic and that led to a TH2 shift and they're having other symptoms going on, specifically neurologic symptoms, this is how a neurozoomer can be supportive of, it may not be the active infection, but it may be autoimmunity going on. And it's nice to see on a piece of paper and document that this is actually an autoimmune reactivity. And then you use a reversal strategy, shifting them from TH2 back to TH1, or more importantly, to Tregs to get that done. This is a great time to think of, do I have food intolerances? And remember my patient who ate gluten and got the bullseye rash back? Um, in leaky gut, gut dysbiosis, if you're constantly have leaky gut and you're, le and you're getting your lipopolysaccharides leaking in, you're basically reinfecting the body so to speak, get these gram-negative bacteria that go in. You can also have a persistent infection if you have a, an immune shift. So it may not be the infection of tick-borne illness, but when you have a TH2 dominance, you actually have a decrease in TH1 and potentially natural killer cells. So you have a decrease in your fighting infection side of the immune system. So you're more susceptible to these ongoing infections. And a, a a good, easy cheat, if you have a lot of seasonal allergies, you tend to shift towards TH2. So considerations for SIRS, this chronic infection, it, this is up to 22% of the population is susceptible to get this. This doesn't mean 22% of the population is going to get it, but there is a susceptibility in 22 to 23% of the population to get any biotoxin illness, which is basically anything, um, any infection that you can get. This can be from Lyme, co-infections, mold, water damage, building exposure, like actinobacter. You can get it from the bacteria of food poisoning. Um, it's a very complicated subject. One of the cheats I just put in here that everybody can do is you can run your uh, human transforming growth factor beta one, and you can see and look at that for clues. If that's off, the immune system is off. And I'll leave it open-ended at that because that's a whole nother course. So, and then the basics, you know, let's not forget about your CBC and your CMP. If you have, and you can check your vitamin D, your, your Bs, your omegas, check your hormones, your thyroid and adrenal hormones. If you see, if you run an iron panel and you see the patient has low iron and low total iron binding capacity, that's what I call a broken seesaw. That's indicative of an inflammatory response quite commonly seen in tick-borne tick illness. So if your iron is low, your total iron binding capacity should be high. If you run both those markers and they're both low, you got to be thinking this is inflammatory. This is not anemia. This is not uh, iron deficiency. This is, or it's anemia, but it's, it's iron deficiency as a consequence of inflammatory states. So think of diet, think of sleep hygiene, your gut health, your stress responses. Are you active? Are you deconditioned? Most of these patients are deconditioned because they're so fatigued anyway. So those are just some considerations for health of host over the strength of the bug. So just to recap here, when you get into the world of tick-borne illness, you want to address all of these. You certainly want to kill or reduce your pathogenic burden. And then you want to support the underlying physiology, which can be um, affected by the fact that they had a pathogenic burden of tick-borne disease. And don't forget, these patients need a lot of support, emotional support. Do they have a good support structure, family structure? Have they been told, most of them have been told, you know, it's all in your head. There's nothing wrong with you. Um, they've been labeled. So um, don't forget that missing piece, which I find a, a, a lot of that is missing. So 
that's kind of it in a nutshell. I want to leave a couple minutes for questions. Dr. Bruno, I want to, I probably didn't give you enough time to talk, so I'd say anything that I missed. I, you covered it all. This is great. This is great. And I love like being able to have this flow chart, making sure that we can zoom out, look for everything, understand that it's not just the kill protocol. We need to treat the host. There's a reason why when they got bit, they were thrown into a sequela of inflammation and immune system shift. And so we need to go back and determine that terrain and then kind of go forward from there. And this really lays it out very nice, gives people a lot of memory joggers to be able to say, oh yes, I need to go, I need to check this. Oh, that's why they're not getting better on the antibiotics and kind of continue to work through it. Because you're right in your example, if somebody didn't have, you know, the bug didn't get killed in 24 years, it's not going to get killed in 25. And I have seen so many patients who have just been on years of antibiotics on the, um, you know, that hamster wheel of the kill protocol, and no one is looking at the oxidative stress, the mitochondrial dysfunction, the immune system shifts. So we really need to pay attention to that and utilize the functional medicine labs that we have to be able to create this flow chart for our patients. And people, some patients feel better when they're on the antibiotic protocol. So they'll mm -hmm. come in begging for antibiotics because it helped them feel better. But every time they come off, they don't feel right again. And there's reasons for that. There's a lot of nuances. Again, there's a lot of nuances we didn't get into, such as biofilms and horizontal translation in the biofilms where these these little bugs breed with one another and they come back out and they look new again. And so there's a lot of nuances that go into this, which is why I started off with, you know, the Dunning-Kruger effect. It's not just identify it and kill it. And it's also not, I only feel good when I'm on antibiotics. If they only feel good when they're on antibiotics, we're missing some of these other criteria that are going on here. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. So did we have any questions that we might be able to answer? So there are a couple of questions listed out in the Q&A that I don't know if you have access to see them. Um, let me know. I, do. I can read them. Okay. Um, okay, so let's see here. We have the first one. What is the four letter kill? Um, I think that was uh, Dr. Turnpaw's just joking that, you know, it, we don't love the, the idea of just protocols because then again, we're every, every patient is different. So kind of makes it a, a bad word when we say protocol. So I think that was in that sense there. Um, as far as, um, and uh, Dr. Turnpaw, I'll just read these off for you. So would a high ferritin 300 with a previous diagnosis of Lyme Borrelia indicate an inflammatory process or reactivation of Lyme? So my answer to that is yes. So the reason I said it, because if, if your ferritin is in the 300s and, you're, and you don't have an iron burden, then the ferritin is the acute phase reactant. So you're going through the Fenton reaction of inflammation and tissue breakdown. I would say with certainty that that patient has tissue breakdown. Now, is that because they have a toxic burden from something else? Is it because they have a reactivation of their Lyme? That's that's the right question. That's the right question. I can't give you the right answer in that specific uh, instance, but I would say they're not healthy. They're, they're not recovered. So one of the things we focus on in the office is resolution. And that patient, whether they have Lyme or not, they have not resolved, indicative of the high ferritin. Thank you. So um, I can see some of these here. Well, one question, and I think they would maybe go together, and actually three of them, I think, go together. One is asking about, does SOT help to completely resolve or help the TH2 dominant shift back? And then we had a couple other questions asking, you know, would there, what is, what are some more specific support on the TH1, TH2 part of immune shift? Um, you know, obviously removing if there is a persistent infection and then figuring out what keeps tipping the teeter-totter, but what else would you use to restore that balance of the Th1 and Th2? So I'll, I'll go backwards. So the SOT, the SOT basically makes a straitjacket for the bug. So it's almost like a specific uh, 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 resolver for that bug, that specific bug. It works over time. It takes several months to work. It, if the immune system is capable of restoring back because you have um, regulatory T cells, it will shift back when the pathogenic burden is gone. 
And then what can you do for a TH2 dominant shift? Well, there, this is a, a broad question, but I would say you have to remove irritants, right? So if they have leaky gut and things, you have to remove that. And then you want to use whatever's in your arsenal to, so I'll throw a couple of things that are very helpful, like quercetin and uh, perilla and turmeric and resveratrol, things that you typically use for that chronic inflammation. But there's a lot of other pieces that go into that. That's a deeper question for sure. But use in your arsenal what you may think of as chronic inflammatory or we'd use for like an arthritis patient or a chronically inflamed patient, something that's chronic. Whatever you choose to use for chronicity typically helps support TH2 or whatever you would use for autoimmunity, you may want to use support for that. Um, Couple questions on viral load. One on Powassan virus uh, as it plays to encephalitis and neuro symptoms. One on Epstein Barr. Um, thoughts on kind of viral load as it relates to tick borne illness. Yeah, so Powassan is very common with uh, neuro Lyme, neuro, neuro symptoms. So Powassan very commonly loves the, the, the central nervous system. And as far as Epstein-Barr, Epstein-Barr, 97% of the population is already had by the age of three. So Epstein-Barr is almost always there. And then what you do is when you suppress that TH1 side and the natural killer side, you can actually get a reactivation of Epstein-Barr. It's also important to know that Epstein-Barr is the most polyreactive antibody we have. So if you kick me in the shins and run an Epstein-Barr titer, it's probably going to come back high because it reacts to everything. It's just one of those, we've had it for such a young age. Um, so yeah, I'll I do see a question here. All right, got it. <laughs> yeah. So, but it, so that tells me though, they have uh, insufficiency of support of their viral load. So that can be anything. I just saw the one about the CD57 and I like to address this because CD57, some will say if your CD57 levels below 60, it's indicative of Lyme. But if you go to an oncologist, they're gonna say it's indicative of potential cancer, right? So CD57 is a mature natural killer cell. It, if it's low, it means your immune system is insufficient in that one aspect. That's all that it means. So it is, a, it is again, a confirmatory. If you have chronic Lyme, CD57 can be low. The reverse can't be said. If your CD57 is low, it doesn't mean it's Lyme. It means your CD57 is low, you have an immune shift, you're dysregulated, and it can mean it can be Lyme, but you know, if, if you're a mold guy, you're going to say it's mold. If you're water damage building, you say water damage building. If you're if you're a Lyme guy, you're going to say it's Lyme or girl, uh, woman. So CD57 is a marker, just like any other marker, understanding what it is. It is a mature natural killer cell that isn't up to speed. So that tells you that TH1 side and natural killer side is probably insufficient. So utilizing it within the matrix Correct. can be really helpful, but as a standalone, probably not. We got to always be looking at that, that matrix, that flow chart, the health of the host. We probably have time just for one more. I think we are right at the top of the hour. Um, let's see here. Have you seen any patients restore their oral tolerance to multiple food reactions after years of struggling with Lyme, mold, or other viruses? I have actually. I have, it, so that's a slow road. It's a constant road. Um, I think in my world, you got to keep away the big nasties. So the big, big toxic ones, but you also want to improve tolerance. You don't want to, to, to live in a food or, or an isolated bubble where they're in food prison and life prison. You want to gradually improve tolerance. And one of the ways to do that is to remove the biggest nasty things in their life. Um, that are affecting them, but also slowly restore tolerance. And that oral tolerance starts with gut health, um, glutathione support, things that are going to really help improve tolerance in their life. And a lot of this comes at the end, that heart, it, emotional tolerance, right? If they don't have the emotional tolerance and they're constantly have an emotional state. So I think to fully resolve these things, it's a holistic approach. And that holistic approach has to include emotional support and tolerance. So when I say tolerance, it's food tolerance, it's chemical tolerance, it's emotional tolerance. All those things are, are you have to improve tolerance of the whole person. Good. All right. Thank you, Dr. Turnpaul. And thank you, Dr. Bruno.
Thank you to all our attendees for your engagement in your business. Vibrant Wellness appreciates your support and the work that you're doing to advance the functional medicine, disease prevention, and wellness model. Immediately following the webinar, you'll receive a short five-question survey. Please complete the survey so that we may gain insight into how well we're meeting your needs or how we can improve on the clinical lab education programs, products, and services we offer you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Thanks.